Good. Hello, everybody. I welcome you also at TechEd. Um, I hope you had an interesting morning, especially since the internet is down. Um, I have a very interesting session today because I have no internet access, and so I have no access to my public cloud area where I would like to show you something. But nevertheless, I would like to talk about what we are doing uh, to give an expression um, and some attention what's going on here. Um, so my name is Alexander Best. I'm uh, Director of uh, Technical Business Development at Datacore Software. And uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, storage virtualization and virtual storage approaches to get you a better approach for managing your storage. Getting cloud perspectives to your internal storage management and how you can use storage in a more effective way and adopting whatever is in there for your internal use. When you look at storage, there are different things what comes up. So we all know that uh, we frequently run out of storage space and we have to get more smart in starting to store our assets. And in my personal life, my wife and kids always have some stuff that is lying around and that's not properly stored. And you could then think about buying a bigger house and moving somewhere else where you have additional storage space or use smarter technologies to get this done better. Um, this is just one approach and not necessarily this is a brilliant approach. But the other thing is when we look at the server world and the server virtualization, we have now a state where we have moved from server sprawl to virtual machine sprawl. So where we had a lot of machines in the data centers in the past, this is now all running on virtual machines. And guess what? It's easier to deploy a virtual machine than to deploy a physical server. This is nothing new. But on the other hand, each virtual machine has specific storage, storage necessit necessities. So we need to have storage there. And this additional demand we create by getting this more flexible virtual machine architectures gives completely new uh, thinking or creates a new thinking, a new demand on storage. So this is very similar to what happened to uh, cars. In the beginning when there was, uh, when there were the cars, when they were built, they were very expensive and we had no traffic jams and stuff and everyone could drive everywhere. And then there was a guy called Henry Ford and he said, yeah, let us build cheaper cars, more affordable cars, cars that better fit to the people. And out of a sudden, we had a lot of cars everywhere, creating traffic jams everywhere, and then also having a problem getting the proper fuel and things like that. So um, the same thing currently happens with the uh, electric cars when we move from gas to electric powered. It would be nice to have all these new electric cars but there is no way to power up the batteries when they run empty. So we have all these changes everywhere, and we have this as well in, in the storage area. So what we are looking at here in this session is some considerations about storage in a cloud perspective, in a private cloud perspective. So this means for your storage, not for the storage that is sitting somewhere else, or for storage where you build storage architectures for your customers. Then we look at, the, at some common reasons why you end up in having problems while you do virtualization projects from the virtual machine perspective and how to overcome these troublesome things. And then we focus a little bit on uh, best practices around storage and storage virtualization. So since the internet is down, I'm pretty sure nobody is here for checking emails. So hopefully everyone is here for getting this session. On the other hand, I would like to uh, encourage you to shut down your phones or at least mute them so that we can continue this session without any further interruption. Um, are you happy with the agenda? 
Okay, great. So at least this is a good starting point. Um, IDC has asked, have asked um, IT managers, what are the common drivers for going to the cloud? And uh, I would like to do a little game with you about how many of you have what driver in their mind. So who of you is thinking about getting a more agile storage to adopt new demands? Can you please raise your hand? Okay. Not too much. Um, who of you is looking at uh, business alignment things? to get it more in line with your business needs, even fewer. Who is driven by costs, reducing the costs? Oh, most of you. Okay, defend IT. This is an interesting fact. So this is meant um, we need to keep the IT internal. So to keep your assets, to keep your job. Who of you is with the problem that uh, if, you go, if you don't move onward, you may be outsourced or replaced by outsourcing companies. Anyone with the problem? Oh, we have even this here. Then the hybrid architecture, going internal, external, private, public cloud thing. Ah, okay. Quality, who has quality problems with the current environment and needs to build better quality? Someone with this, at least one, two, okay. <laughs> and who isn't sure why he's here and if he, if he ever needs the cloud, anybody here? Okay. So interesting is um, when you look what happened there, um, by doing this questionnaire, it turned out that 55% um, are just because of the agility of the flexibility are looking at the, cloud, at the cloud storage in the private cloud context. To get everything that is possible on the public cloud into the private cloud architecture. So this means in the internal IT to adopt the same mechanics that you have when you go to Amazon and ask for server and for storage capacity, it's just there, to get the same thing internal, for example. Um, this is a bit different from the audience yet, but not a problem because um, we will see throughout the session that um, we will have similar uh, things in common here. You may have seen this symbol um, on TechEd already or on Windows 8. We turned it around a little bit. This has possibly to do that there was TechEd in Orlando the other day. Uh, it looks a little bit like Mickey Mouse. Um, but what I'm talking about is how storage today is basically built. And most of storage areas or storage systems are built in a way that you have a central called reliable storage device and a bunch of servers attached to it and relying to this storage system. To be honest, this is a pretty Mickey Mouse approach because if you have all eggs in one basket, the basket falls down, everything is done. So you can think about doubling it. Okay buying two Mickey Mouses, having now Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, and both are replicating data with, you, with each other, is getting you forward in terms of, okay, I have my data doubled, I have it twice, and if one breaks, I can recover on the other side. But if you look at traditional storage approaches, these storages are able to replicate the data, but you have no synchronous move over to the other side, so no non-stop approach. So you can't survive a system failure. You can replicate, but you can only replicate within a system f family. You can only replicate in a machine family. Um, and you can only replicate within a single vendor. So what you do then, it, because you know all these lock-ins, that you buy the system with half the capacity to expand in future, that if you get more storage that you need, you can expand whenever it's there, but you buy this in at a price because you have to pay up front a lot of money to be flexible. And it just buys you some flexibility, but keeps you still locked into this vendor. And if this vendor doesn't bring you new interesting features, you just can look at your neighbors and the grass is always greener on the other side. 
So you're always missing something that would be critical, crucial for your business. And these are things that uh, can be achieved with private cloud architectures in terms of storage. This would mean within um, storage virtualization environments. So we get the capability to gain agility, to gain speed on performance side, so from the absolute operation performance, but also adoption speed by having easier ways to get new technologies in and old technologies out, having hassle-free migration operations. You can reduce the cost because you can select whatever device you want and combine all these different devices that are out there on the market. And you can align this all with your business needs. You don't have to bring your business to the storage. You can bring your storage to your business need. OK, back to Mickey Mouse. Um, we have the same thing, as I said already, with the car industry. I like, I like this example because when you look at cars, everyone tries to get more mileage out of a liter of gasoline to get far, to save money, to save the environment and everything. But we all know whatever they are doing, they have to do it different. Keeping the combustion engine is a dead end street. So they have to do different things, going to hydrogen cars, doing electric cars, doing whatever. Maybe in 100 years we're flying around with jetpacks. I don't know. But the world is changing. And you can't stick with the old system if the world is changing. Because if you don't move along with it, you are out of the business. So um, we have a fancy cloud model. Who is familiar with this? Who of you? OK. OK. Who has understood it? OK. One, two, good. I will teach you now in the next 35 minutes what this slide means. OK? No, I'm joking. I will, I will get this to a smaller fraction, because we are looking just at infrastructure as a service, and we are just concentrating at the storage infrastructure as a service. And in this environment, we only have, let's say, four simple parts. But these four simple parts are crucial to have an agile, cost-sensitive, environment that can be adaptive. Okay, when you look at cloud storage, you first of all need to be able to pool your resources. Resources are built in physical entities and uh, think about virtual server environments. You build processor pools, you build memory pools, and then you create virtual machines out of it. Can you do this currently with your storage hardware you're buying in? Can you take multiple devices and combine them and let them act as a singular device that you can slice and dice as you need it? If you stay within the box, possibly. But if you have to go cross boxes, if you have to break out the hardware frame, you are done. The next thing is getting automation, because everything we are looking at in the uh, cloud environment is self-service. So everything should run on its own based on end user demands, based on system demands. And therefore, you need automation systems that are doing things in the background based on your profiling, based on the things you define to move along with the environment and to grow as you go, to adopt and to integrate whatever is required at any given time. So some of, you, some of you may think, OK, that's far too big. Because this is fine for a large company with 15,000 users, 20,000 seats that has petabytes of storage. But to be honest, it's not. Um, getting the private cloud principle into your internal IT system 
gives you the ability, even if you have only 15 users. Because you're dealing with data, you're dealing with storage, and you have to adopt your business needs. And it changes every day. You get new requirements day by day. And in the past, you always buy something that, or you bought something for future growth. So you paid up front for things that you possibly never got to. Who of you has this magical crystal sphere to look into to say, OK, my business in five years will be exactly how the system is designed when I buy it today? Who knows how the systems and the environment is moving onward in the next five years? Hands up, please. OK, no one. So why do you buy a storage hardware with a maintenance plan for five years and the expansion cap capability to go for the next five years? Why do you do this? It's ridiculous. OK? So why not buy what you need for the next 12 months and just increase and go forward as you need? OK, who knows about the business within the next 12 months? Who has a scope somehow? Ah, some hands are raising, OK. So question, why do you, not, you do not buy systems scaled for the next 12 months? Any opinion? You do? OK, that's great. And why can you do this? <laughs> OK, this could be one opinion. Um, the, the thing people most likely not buy for just 12 months is the migration hassle, if the decision was wrong, is bigger than buying for five years' time and then maybe having done a don, uh, uh, wrong decision because you have room to move, you have headroom. But on the other hand, you throw away a lot of money. And especially when you look at the smaller companies with less seats, less storage capacity, even there it's more crucial to save the spendings, to cut down the costs, and to be more agile. So the system, the general private cloud system, and this echo system infrastructure is the same regardless how big your company is. And the next thing we can look at is how community work is done. So if there, or we have a lot of public and, yeah, public customers, educational customers that start to consolidate their storage infrastructure in a community cloud because there is no competition. There is no um, intellectual property where they have to shut them off. For example, if you look at schools, it's just for the kids' education, and the goal of all the, of these is the same. So what they're doing is they're just combining into something they call community clouds to get this all done. OK, so looking at the cloud again, uh, the challenge that you see most often with the virtualization from the server perspective is that you decide not to put something on a virtual machine because it's too mission critical. You say, OK, if this whole architecture is breaking down, then your mission critical system is not available. And uh, yeah, to be honest, um, failure is not an option. So this means that when you build something on a, on a virtual infrastructure, it has to be highly available. And if you look at the storage that is acting in a virtual infrastructure, this also, this principle also applies 100% for the storage. You can't build a virtual infrastructure cluster where you have your virtual machines highly available that sit on a single point of failure storage. Because if your storage is out, what happens to your cluster? Will you have any machine running when your storage is missing? No, because it's all sitting on a shared storage device. And uh, this is very important because um, people, when looking at the server virtualization, in about 60% still only do virtualization halfway through. They stop when they look at storage. 
They do everything from the server perspective, from the network perspective. Everything is resilient, it's redundant. But then there's a single storage box sitting in a single room, having a redundant air conditioning system, but sitting in a room. And if the plumbing fails and water drains in, the storage is gone. And all your high availability is gone as well. And this is why you need different thinking and have to think about something that is not built in an entity that is not sitting on a physical location that is acting like a cloud. So it's everywhere and nowhere. Sounds a bit fuzzy, but um, it's true. It's physically represented somewhere, but when you look at it, it's here and maybe there, like a cloud. It's transparent. And whatever you, we did there is, is very much the same that Citrix and Microsoft and VMware have done for the server world. So we have something that we call a storage hypervisor. And this storage hypervisor sits in between the physical storage and the application layer. And the application layer in this case means physical servers or server hypervisors where you virtualize machines. And we do pretty much the same. So we create a virtual disk entity that is not really existing, but it feels, it tastes, it behaves like it's really there, but you simply can't touch it because it's virtual. And since it's virtual, we can do a lot of things. We can present a shared device that is truly a redundant, resilient device that continues working even if single components or sing single buildings, half of the campus is failing. So benefits of virtual storage we have a few. We have the capability of pooling the devices. So in the server world, it's no problem. You can buy a server from HP, from IBM, from Dell, and put them all into a server cluster. And your virtual machines can be happily moved crisscross. Yeah, no problem. We can do the same for storage. You can take a storage from EMC, from HP, from Dell, from whoever, put them in a single pool, and then let your data move around wherever you want to have it. It works with a just-in-time fulfillment. So this means you can just in time buy new storage assets to increase your storage pool. You can also decrease just-in-time. So you can decommission storage on the fly when you no longer need it. But to be honest, most customers I'm talking to are only growing. They are not shrinking. We have the capability to shrink data pools. And you can tier the storage. You can do a classical tiering by serving LUNs from different devices, but you can also do what we call dynamic or automatic tiering so that we recognize your I.O. profile that is coming down from the application layer to the virtual disk. And then the virtual disk on its own is taking individual data blocks and moves it to the appropriate device. And we can do this in a hybrid way. So you can move this from on-premises to off-premises storage, or you can do it from spinning disk to non-spinning disks. You can do it from local devices to remote accessible devices. There is no limit. You can do whatever you want. And all this stuff is running on a thin world, so it allocates on demand. And it also deallocates on demand. This means if you free up resources, we are capable of deflating your already dolled out storage resources by unlinking virtual blocks in the system to always have it adaptive to your true needs. And since performance is not predictable in this world, we assist you with high-speed caching to get performance forward. And by the way, since we are virtual, we do this all in a highly available fashion. Sounds too good to be true, uh, but it's working. We are not doing this since yesterday. We're doing this for 14 years now. And some people know, some people don't know. On the other side, let us now look at some of the specific things, resource sharing, for example. If you have multiple devices in your network, uh, it doesn't make sense to have them separate. It makes sense to combine the power of the system and to dole out whatever is required on a specific system. So try to get the best out of the system and take whatever makes sense. So if you need some 
flash storage because you need high performance, just integrate it, just attach it. Don't wait until your storage vendor supports flash media. With us, if you have the requirement, attach it, use it. Same thing for going to archive media, going to cloud media that is sitting off premises. You don't have to wait, just do it. And by <coughs> buying the components as you need, you can control costs. So I would have done a demo at this point. <coughs> uh, at the moment, it, it looks like the internet is on its way to come back. Let me see. Let me see. As I said, um, I would have loved to do it. but doesn't look very promising. Okay. So, um, since there is no internet, I have no cloud access. Um, but if you like to and like to see what we are doing, yeah, you can visit us at booth P2. And um, there we can show you much more about it. So, I will continue talking. Unfortunately, I can't show something. Um, but uh, if at the next demo slot, the internet may be available. I will give it another try. Okay. What I would have shown you <laughs> is how dynamic, thin provisioning is working and how the system is allocating storage on demand. Um, the problem with storage is that storage uh, is, is from an operating system perspective and from an application perspective, really a dumb thing. It's really stupid. Because the only thing you can do is uh, give it a size. So you have to say, I have a LUN, a disk, and you have to tell it it's a certain amount of gigabytes large or terabytes large. And then the operating system is cutting this up in slices to organize it, to put data on it. And to get this working um, fine, uh, you can only work with fixed blocks. So when you have a database administrator and ask them, oh, how much data will your database occupy within the next two years, he will give you a figure that is 50% larger than he really expects because if he runs out of space, he's in trouble. Since you are the manager for storage, you think about, okay, that's the size he needs to be on the safe side because if something goes wrong, I don't want to be the source of the blame. I give him 50% extra. So, and then you create the storage and the problem then is that you run out of your, out of your budget because you oversize the storage all the time. And after five years of usage and you have to decommission the storage, you recognize about 60% of your storage was idling all the time because no, never ever data was put on it because everyone wants to be on the safe side. And if someone has storage, he never gives it back. Have you ever experienced someone saying, ah, oh, you gave me two terabytes, but I only need one. You have it back. Did you have this? No. People are not doing this. So to get this done, we only give them storage that appears to be there and is built in the moment they request it. So what we do is we create a virtual disk device that gives him the maximum possible size he can grow into, but if he never access the storage, it simply doesn't give, give it to him. It just stays in the pool, and the user doesn't even recognize it. He is happy. Oh, I have a one petabyte disk. This is a really cool thing, and I put a lot of data on it, but I never need it. I just put one gigabyte on it. It's fine, but I have a petabyte disk on my laptop. This looks really cool. This is technically possible. You can do this. Um, and the good thing is you don't even need to have the physical storage in the back end because we are capable of over provision your physical storage assets and you can fulfill at time just in time so when you reach a certain fill rate then you just put another disk source in and this means any source so if you can't buy vendor A after three year time then go to vendor B that does the same thing and just put it into the pool and the system is just claiming the storage resources as it needs it. 
And this is what cloud means. The user has the vision of getting whatever he wants to have. You fulfill it, getting a happy camper at the user side because he can always use what he wants. And you can work with the stuff in the background to fulfill his needs when he needs it, not when he thinks he needs it, but when he really needs it. Uh, another example about what the cloud can do is getting better performance. So in my job, I have to drive a lot. And I use a navigational system to get from A to B because I'm a dumb guy. I'm just sitting in my car waiting for this lady in the box to talk to me. And uh, it's interesting. If you think about going from A to B, you think usually you are fastest when using the shortest road, right? Because the point between A and B that's the shortest, where you get the fastest, is a direct link, right? No. Because if you go the direct way from A to B, you're going through small towns, you have real race drivers in front of you, you can't overtake, and all these things. So what the navigational system does to get you more speed is it sends you a detour on a faster lane. It sends you to the highway, it sends you to everywhere where there is no traffic problem. And the cloud is capable to do the same thing. It can give you more performance by doing it more intelligently. This means, for example, that we can use an extra hop with the caching, so we have memory buffers in between. Between your disk and your application, there is memory. So you go through memory to random access memory to speed up the read and the write process. So what we can do is, first of all, we improve read speed. This is not, not a big trick because we just keep data in memory to serve it from memory when it's used multiple times. But the other thing we're doing is we take the write I.O. and reorganize, coalesce the write I.O. to de-stress the backend. Because the worst thing that you can have is that you really talk to the disk drive because the disk drive is slow like hell. Uh, in a computer world, it's always painful to work with disks because they're never fast enough. And if I go back 10 years, 20 years, it was always the disk. There was never a processor that was slower than your disk. It was always the disk that was slower than your processor. And also the network. The network usually is also faster than the disk. And at the disk, everything breaks down because you have to store it permanently. You have to do it. There's no way around it, but it's slow. And the only way to do it is to reorganize the traffic to get the, the I.O. pattern in a way that the disk is more um, linear accessed to rule out the random access mechanism of the disk to get it in a sequential pattern. And that's what we are doing with the coalescing. So we can take ran a bunch of random 4K blocks that's coming in from the database. And if we find a sequence in it, we make a single stroke write out of it. So take 10 writes of 4K. If you detect the sequence, it's a one write, 40K. And if this hits the rate controller in the back end, this is just a single operation versus 10 operations. And this is reducing I.O. overhead and is giving you additional performance. Uh, we just recently did an interesting test. So we had a, a hardware test bed. It was a, a Windows database server running in Formix. And uh, for one cycle of the tests, it was attached to a very popular storage system, a NetApp Fast 2020. 12 drives in it, very popular, especially in the smaller environments. The other system was um, a Fujitsu Eternus, so not a very common storage device, uh, but we equipped it with the same number of spindles and fronted it with a data core storage hypervisor. And then we had a, a software testbed. In this testbed, we had 8.8 .8 million records stored in the database, and the runtime operation we did to test what's going on was selecting 750,000 records without an index, so doing a full table scan going across 8.8 .8 million records and storing them in a temporary table on the disk. This test was repeated three times and the database server was completely stopped between each test to eliminate any database caching mechanism. The FAST 2020 did a really good job because it 
needed 13 minutes for this really horror operation in a SQL database scenario. What do you think? How much did we improve this operation with our caching mechanism, doing the read and write? Who thinks about what? 10%? Hands up? No one. Okay. Not even 10%. 5%? Anyone for 50%? 50%, okay. More than 100%, anyone with the, okay, okay. Breaking the 200% barrier, who is going for more? Okay, no opinion for the rest? Okay, believe it or not, we increased by nearly 600% without doing any fancy database tuning, doing anything, just doing the same operation that is fronted by a caching system. And in this case, because we needed to, or we needed to do it in a, in a small environment, we only spoke about uh, 10, 12 gigabytes of cache that we had. Our caching is capable of having up to one terabyte of cache memory per storage hypervisor. And you can scale them in a grid. So you can have multiple nodes acting independently, doing the caching independently. So you have scalability opportunities that are tremendous. We will look at this again in a VDI thing. And there I'm lucky because I don't need the internet, therefore. Uh, so I can show you the, the VDI results because we, we took a little video and we look at this then later on. So at least there's something we can look at. Okay. Beside the caching, there is another thing you can do. And this thing you can do additional is getting faster storage in. So going from spinning disks to flash media, solid state storage architectures. But the problem with solid state storages is uh, they are expensive, they are small in size, and they have the problem they die after some time because you have only a limited number of write cycles when talking to this device. And the data is not so non-volatile as it should be because after a year of usage, you may have lost your device. You can still read from it, but can't write any more data to it. Anyhow, going along with the spinning disk is not, not so effective as introducing a certain number of, let's say, non-spinning disks. And to cover the costs, possibly put some of your data off-premises into a cloud storage, into an external cloud, where you can buy in the storage cheaper than really having the assets in-house. Uh, the problem is that you have to keep this internal cloud and this external cloud together. You can do this now by assigning your storage individually to each independent application and manage 10 storage systems with 15 GUIs and 20 command line interfaces and uh, hiring 50 experts to do your storage management. Or you can put a storage hypervisor as a central control element to front all this, to use them as a pool storage architecture to dole out the storage where you need it with a single interface, with a single entity going up to the application because any device that is coming out of the storage hypervisor is a uniform device. It's always accessed the same way. It has the same vendor code. It uses the same MPIO architecture. It uses the same driver regardless what's acting in the back end. And it does the same thing on iSCSI. It does the same thing on Fiber Channel. You don't have to care. It's just the same thing regardless where it comes from. It really makes it hardware agnostic, vendor agnostic, driver agnostic. And if you then look uh, again at the tiering, and in the classical tiering model, you dole out a LUN of a specific performance speed to a specific application. But a LUN today is not bound to a single application. If you are in a server virtualization world, a LUN is hosting multiple virtual machines with multiple virtual disks. And these multiple virtual disks have different performance profiles. And now it gets even more interesting because within the virtual disk, you have hot data and you have cold data. So data that needs to be accessed frequently 
and other data that could be pushed somewhere else where it just needs to be, but no one is interested in it, but it has to be there. And how do you manage this on a granular level, on a block level? You can't. You're not able to manage your storage on a file level in this granular way, because even in files, if you look at a database, you have hot areas and you have cold areas. And the only way is doing this tiering approach down at a block level, and this is what we allow you to do. So if you want to do dynamic tiering across vendors, across technologies on a block level, this is what we give you. So you can just um, put different performance devices into a single pool, and then your virtual disk will be dynamically combined with disk blocks coming from different sources. And um, the frequently accessed blocks are then sitting on the highest tier, and blocks no one is interested in are moving down to the lowest tier. And you can even um, modify what we call the storage profile. So this means that you can tell a disk to have more capacity tied to a faster disk because you need more performance over a short period of time. You can schedule the behavior of the disks and the data blocks are moved around transparently between the different performance levels and you don't have to care for it. The system does it automatically based on your profiling mechanism that you assign to the individual disks. These metrics are monitored in real time. So we look at the I.O. profile that is going to the disk constantly. And we are able to adopt different performance metrics in a very fine grain. So we can, we can change our mind in a granularity of five seconds. So if, the, if we detect there is a higher performance demand every five seconds, we can readjust what is required and can start moving the blocks around to get always the right performance. And then again, you can schedule something. So if you say you have an ERP system or something that has a scheduled report that runs once a month, but usually only five users are sitting on this and so moderate storage is okay, but for two days in the month you need really high performance to get data out, so why not schedule to get this disk temporarily higher performance without touching the application, but just assigning a different profile to the disk? It moves up to tier one, has high performance. After the uh, query is run, you degrade it again, and it moves around and moves there where it fits best. And again, I would have liked to show this to you. Um, let me see if we get internet access in the meanwhile. Um, hmm. Yay! And you see, there is a cloud. Okay, so Microsoft has done it somehow. Okay. Ha, all the emails are coming in as well. Okay. Let's see if we're in a, in a short rush or if we get there. Okay, looks good. I would have, lo have loved to prepare this a little bit more, but now I have to wait for the UI to, to initialize uh, a little bit. So I will give you a little impression on how this tiering mechanism is, is, is going to work um, and uh, how you can move data around with these um, tiering architectures. Any questions so far? I would, I would like to do the Q&A at the end basically, but since I have some wait time at the moment, because we have it doubled. Yeah, we will see this also in a second. Um, 
So when you look at here, um, you will see that this uh, storage server group is consistent, consisting of three nodes in this case. Um, to get high availability, you need at least two nodes, but we can asymmetrically grow the crit. In this case, we have a three node crit. East and West node are there for performance, and North node in this scenario is a designated uh, backup node where they synchronously mirror the storage and where you can do a failover. We will look at this at the final session then. Um, so you will see here that we have the disk pools, which, are, which I would shown to you earlier when we had internet access. And these disk pools, in this case, are consisting of um, two devices. And currently, these devices are sitting in a single tier. So currently, this pool is not doing any tiering because it's all the same, and we treat all the same. So first of all, what we can do is we can grow the pool by just adding another device. And uh, by accident, I have a physical device here sitting idle. I will just assign to the pool. And um, my data pool is then simply taking this device and putting it in. And now it starts to claim this device. And I have some virtual disk that is already carved out of the pool. This is what you see in blue. And these blue sections will now start to possibly move around, but not necessarily because I'm currently not doing pretty much I.O. from the application side. But they're sitting there. And if I now, uh, since I have three tiers, go to the um, tiering and tell it the smallest disk will be tier one, because I assume this is an SSD. I have not much capacity. So I move it to tier one. And the largest one is a SATA, I would assume. Um, oh, let's see. OK, we are back. Um, and the largest, largest one, I say, is a tier three disk. I really love this. But what you see now is that automatically, because I have now a three-tier architecture, the system is starting to move data blocks in the appropriate tier. So when it has capacity and performance available, it tries to adopt the performance immediately. So you do not need to touch the application to speed it up. You just do it in the back end. You do it in the cloud. And why do you do this in the cloud? You do this in the cloud because um, Your, um, the idea is to be adaptive to your business needs without touching the application. So when you get a different business requirement, you just fulfill it without doing migration, without doing application redesign. You just go there where it hurts the hardest, and this is where it's the slowest, and that's the disk and just make it more agile. So the other thing is that you need to have um, a management perspective for the whole thing. So you need to integrate this, this complete thing into a standards-based management architecture. And um, ah, sorry, when we look at this, then um, you you need to interface this with all sorts of, of management interfaces, but we look at this in a minute. The other thing, just going back to the, to the performance, is um, when I speak about this and I have a specific performance level for a disk that's doled out, this is defined by performance, availability, and the location where, where you should put it. But since life's going on, it may happen that the, the user mind is changing and an application is no longer um, as uh, important as it was earlier because there is another one that's in replacement. And with this um, management in the background, you can adjust your application need 
to your storage without adjusting the application. It's easier to adjust this in the background than to migrate your application to a slower storage from the application perspective. Just let it sit there and change the behavior of the storage and just do this on the fly. So if someone then says, okay, a migration failed and we have to fall back to the system we had previously, just change the requirement, give it more, and you are back where you are without doing a real hassle migration task at the application level. And if then the migration or the new system is getting up to speed and everything is fine, you can reduce it again. And this is what we can do with these auto tiering mechanisms in the background. The other thing I just uh, looked forward to was the uh, management tools. You can integrate this architecture in any kind of management infrastructure. If you use the system center architecture, if you use Windows PowerShell as an automation tool, you can also integrate this seamlessly into VMware. Uh, same thing that, that Microsoft is doing also for the system center because system center is capable of managing Hyper-V beside VMware. We can integrate in the one or the other, or you can use external tools for monitoring like the Hitachi Analyzer or any kind of SNMP-based system to monitor and work with this environment and to automate things. Um, the next thing is um, mobility. You have virtual machine mobility, but uh, do you have also storage mobility? You can't move your storage assets around usually, but um, we can, and we can build it resilient. And this was the question you had earlier. How do you protect against storage failures? Easy, just double it, have it in two physical sites, have them synchronously connected, and if you like to, you can even have an asynchronous replication going to a remote facility several hundred kilometers away using a slow bandwidth link to get even a disaster safe data storage somewhere else where you can run a disaster plan against. Whenever you have um, the ability to move something into two places, you will do it. Do you keep your, all your keys on one key ring? Also the redundant ones? No, you have, to you have a separate key stored somewhere if you need to have access to it in a, sec in a safe place. And this is why you, why you keep data doubled. And what we do is we synchronously mirror. And if one side fails from an environmental problem, air condition is failing or something, you can simply continue working because you have this virtual entity up there in the middle that is accessible regardless if one side or the other side fails because there's still access to your data entity. You can't control environmental problems. So in the US, we face more the problems of hurricanes and stuff, but um, here we have very frequent power outages that just the power is not there or that the air conditioning fails. And if you then have no access to your data, you, um, you have a problem. But the other thing is not only to plan for the unexpected, you also have to plan for the expected because if you use a system for several time, by nature, you start migrating. You start rolling out old things and rolling in new things. And if all these roll in, roll out phases always mean downtime, then you're not flexible. And if you can do all the expected work while staying up and running, this gives you a really easy life because we deliver a non-stop working architecture. So let me see if I still have internet access. Uh, by the way, all my data is now moved to my highest tier because there is enough space to put it in there. And now I have the highest performance. Um, let me check. Uh, I have an application server that is here, an exchange server. 
that is also getting some, uh, or that is receiving the data. Where is my mouse cursor? Here. Okay. Come on. Okay. Seems to take a while. Possibly, if it takes more than nine minutes, I'm running out of. Oh, disconnected from remote workspace. Okay, give it another try. I'm sorry for this. It should have been slightly different. Okay, here is my exchange server. And what you see here is a console that is showing you the multipath state, so the redundant access state to the disk that is provided from my private cloud storage. And when you look in there, you see I have currently two disks. And um, one node that's responsible for it is the east node, and the other node is the west node. And um, what I will do now is I take uh, some data, and I start copying the data around here. And while this is happening, I'm now going to stop one of the nodes for maintenance. So I take it down. But my application doesn't care. So I'm running maintenance while moving data, while using the system. So this node is now stopped. And the copy is still running, no error. It just keeps on working. And when I do a look into my um, environment, I will see that I'm now sitting on the other side of the mirror copy. And it just kept on working. So you see, I lost the path here but it's still there. And I can now st even stop another node. I can now stop the west node even because I still have the north as a redundancy node for both sides. And the system stays up and running and keeps on copying. Um, so that's the way how we achieve high availability by just having synchronous copies of the data that are always accessible. We have no active passive mechanism. It's always active. You can change your path at will while you're accessing it. The whole architecture is done fully redundant, and uh, the virtualization layer, the storage hypervisor, is making incompatible devices compatible with each other to allow them to replicate data, including the transparent failover mechanism. And by the way, we don't care what attachment technology you're using on the front end or on the back end. You can just use whatever you want and whatever makes sense. And additional, if your both data centers go down, boom, just flip over to the disaster recovery site, start working there. And if you switch on the lights again, you can go back. Because we replicate in both ways. So you can temporarily work at the remote site keep the business running while it stores the replicated or the data to replicate. And when this site comes back up, it first replicates the data back into your live site. And then you can fall back at will. If something is missing over there, just rebuild it and then let the data replicate in. No worries. So 
So the system has the capability of doing synchronous high availability combined with asynchronous disaster recovery mechanisms managed from a single console. So you don't have to buy storage with all the bells and whistles. Just take whatever storage you have and put it at the right place and fulfill your business needs by let the hypervisor do all the work. And then there is a, a miracle, magical thing. Whenever you, you, you watch a science fiction movie, sooner or later, someone is capable of traveling in time. Yeah. We have a magical undo button, a flux compensator, the source code to go back in time because we can provide you continuous data protection. This system is continuously journaling any I.O. going to a specific disk, and then you can go back in time, 48 hours, to any point in time, and reach this point in time in a consistent state. You don't need any agent on the application layer. You don't need nothing. Just enable it, let it run, and if you need to go back half an hour, if you need to go back 24 hours, just go there, start it up, and you have it. We keep track of every change, of every sync request that is coming in on the SCSI level. We are aware of any power on recovery point, of any checkpoint that is sent to your mission critical database. Just go there and then do a, a fraction of a roll forward instead of going back 24 hours to your last snapshot and then roll forward 23 hours of journal. Just go one hour back, use it. That's what we can do there. It's so convenient um, that, that it's, it's like a TiVo. You have these the time-shifting video recorders, time-shifting satellite receivers. If you need to pee during a football game, you just press on pause, come back. Then there's a commercial break. You roll forward. That's cool. And you can do the same with your data. OK, this is all built in this cloud thing. And finally, after talking a lot about all these things, we have a brief look on VDI. And uh, in this VDI uh, snapshot, <laughs> we are looking at what we are doing with the snapshot technology. If you have a VDI environment, you have multiple copies of the same virtual machine entity sitting somewhere. And what we can do is create them virtually. So you have a golden image. And this golden image is cross-linked via snapshotting. Each snapshot we create is read-writable. And they are sitting on the same caching source. And the cool thing is, when you read the first time, you read really from disk. And all other systems that are starting from these VDI devices are starting from memory, no longer from disk, because you only need to read the data once. And all other snapshots, clones, whatever, are relinked to this memory region. Okay. And um, what I can show you there is a little video we took from a VDI bootstorm in a native way. And in a way, if it's data core cache and snapshot assisted. Watch at the stop clock and how long it takes to boot the two environments. They are sitting on the same disk, but one disk system is fronted by a data core system, and the other one is accessed native. And on the data core assisted side, we have created snapshots for each VDI entity. And as I said, you read it only once, and all the rest come from memory. And the total boot up time for this VDI environment is significantly faster than if you have to retrieve everything from the disk. So this one side is already booted up while the other one still keeps on bringing up the desktops. But it's no wonder. It's the, it's, it's the power of memory. So whatever we can store in memory, we can deliver from memory and we can reduce access time significantly. And since the disk is presented in read-write fashion, there is no limit. You can keep these desktops 
up and running for weeks. And if you want to reset them, just set them back to the golden image state and you have cleared them. On the other side, you leave them running. The user can run it. It's still booting. So as you see, we could be about three times faster um, in this direct comparison. And then I stressed this fact several times already, expand as needed. If you need more, just get more. If you get more users and you need more performance, just grow. Grow as you need. Get more storage devices in. Get more storage hypervisors in. Get more ports in. Grow as you need and go forward with your business requirement. And don't let your requirement dictate your business. Let your business dictate your requirement by the power of the cloud. Okay, conclusion. The storage virtualization is truly the next wave of virtualization because no one looked at storage beforehand in detail, but we do since 14 years. And it pays off what we did in the past years, and you can benefit from this, and you can build your private adaptive cloud for the reaching down to the storage. The transformation is very easy. It's uh, just go there because you can run a classical storage environment with a virtual environment side by side and you can transparently move over. But without it, you face specific issues. And uh, if you look at your future storage architecture, definitely think about storage to have it at the same flexible elastic state that you can have with your server infrastructure. No one today who is honestly building an IT infrastructure is building on dedicated servers. Everyone today is building a server infrastructure on a virtual server infrastructure because you can go there and kill one of the physical servers and your virtual machine service is just restarted somewhere else. But can you go in there and pull the power cord of your storage? No, you don't want to. You won't even tell somebody where the storage is because it will be no good thing to stop you using it. Okay. If you have any questions, you're free to send me an email. Uh, I will be here on TechEd until Friday. Um, we are at booth P2 directly when you enter the Tech Expo. Um, and there you find me as well. We are easy to identify. We all wear these red shirts. Um, other resources for TechEd, uh, as you know, there are several things to get you up to speed with the whole uh, show throughout the week. And uh, finally, please do me a favor and rate the session. So go there and give me some points <laughs> and let me know if it, was, if it was interesting for you. If you have any questions, I'm now here for a few more minutes or otherwise you can visit me at the booth. And uh, if there are no more questions, I thank you for your time and sorry for the internet.